Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is the actual book launch, Don, for this wonderful book, Tom. It is. Yeah, Tom today. Tom Clancy Target Acquired. So we've had a wonderful time with Tom Clancy's, well, let me, let me go back and say that the Clancy verse is something that various writers have written in. Mark Graney, Mark Cameron, Mike Madden, I think, did, um, did Greg write or was he just in the Custler verse? I'm trying to remember. I think Greg was in the Custler verse and now Don. Um, and so here at Poison Pen, we talk about the Custler verse because Clive was our guy, but there mm -hmm. certainly is a Clancy verse, there's a Parker verse. And so a lot of it depends on whether when a beloved author dies, as Tom Clancy did in 2013, the fans want the stories to continue and whether the publisher can find talented writers who can keep it up and whether there's a playbook for that. And Don can certainly talk to you about that. Anyway, Tom Clancy was the author of over 18 number one New York Times bestsellers, um, The Hunt for Red October, which is also a great movie, um, mm -hmm. right in there. And Don, well, Don, you tell us your own, because you have a really interesting platform. You're coming to this as, as a guy who actually has lived what, what you're writing about. So what are your credentials for this? Yeah, sure. And thanks again for having me, Barbara. It's always a blast to be on with you guys. So I spent 10 years in the Army and was uh, an uh, Apache um, helicopter pilot. And, and during that time, I did uh, one combat tour to Afghanistan as an Air Cavalry Troop Commander. And then uh, when I got out of the Army, I spent some time in the FBI as a special agent and a SWAT team guy. And then since getting out of the FBI for my day job, I've spent uh, most of it working for companies who make and, and market technology to special operations command. So a lot of opportunity there to rub shoulders with some really, really interesting people that I stole and, and, and used in each one of my books, including Target Acquired. Right. You've written two books with a different hero, a hero of your That's own. Right. Let's see, without sanction and the outside man, which is what we talked That's about right. when, back in February. Yeah, just a couple months ago. Yeah, right. back in March. And we do have, we're down to six signed copies of this wonderful book, proving that there are plenty of Tom Clancy fans who are still continuing to read them. Our host for this evening is Brad Taylor, whose most recent book for the task force is called American Trader. And, and Brad Taylor too has these incredible, there must be something about the military that you never spews out writers when you guys are through shooting or whatever it is. So <laughs> what, what is your platform, Brad? Because you have a really impressive career before you left to become an author. Yeah, I served uh, 22 years in, in the United States Army and almost all that time in special operations. And so I kind of use that in the books too, so. Well, you've had a lot of on the ground experience then, a uh, lot of travel. Um, Multiple tours in Afghanistan, Iraq, and Bosnia, and a bunch of classified places I can't talk about. And one of the one of the really great things about Brad's series is that he does do this on the ground research. And so mm -hmm. I find that the landscapes of the books have enormous personality. Thank you. Um, so I have a question for you, which left over from a conversation we had in the last hour for a little discussion group, um, which is, you know, you've inherited a series with a cast done, and Brad mm -hmm. has created a series with um, multiple players. And so, you know, at the end, when you're delivering all the thrills and your, your thriller plot is unwinding and so forth, is it a constraint that you can't really kill them off? Or can you take an occasional, you know, an occasional character and pick them to the curb, so to speak? Um, I'm right, laughing, so I'll let you. I'll interrupt here and say you're stealing my questions. Oh, I'm okay. sorry. Well, that's the only one I'm going to ask, so we're good. Um, I wanted no. to ask it. I wanted to ask it in the last hour. We ran out of time, so anyway, um, Don, you might even have more constraint because. You do have to operate in the Clancy verse. Brad could, in fact, decimate the task force and raise a new one if he really felt like it, and only his editor would, you know, have a voice. But you don't get to do that. I, I don't get to do that, and the reason why I was laughing actually is there is a um, Twitter follower um, on, or there's a, a woman on Twitter who is a super fan who I think loves Brad with all of her heart and hates him at the same time because he killed her favorite character. Lady and D. so she actually, Lady D, she goes by the nomenclature Lady D on Twitter to, in memoriam of the of the character Brad so heartlessly killed. So, was D. so she goes by Lady D. <laughs> 
so it is um killing a character and it's funny because uh because mr taylor was busting my chops about this uh, a little bit earlier it's you know it's it's really really hard when you're writing a series that is you know whether it's the clancy series whether it's your own series or what have you that there's a certain certain group of characters that readers come to expect to be there in that series and so on one on one hand they're thinking in their back of their head you know, these are these are characters that the author spent a lot of time developing that maybe the series has spent a lot of time developing and so they're untouchable. But on the other hand, you still have to have some way to convey the weight of the narrative, right, that's happening, that there has to be stakes there. You know, and I remember like probably most of the, uh, of the world who started reading George R.R. R. Martin when he first came out of Game of Thrones is, you know, I was reading that in, in the early 2000s and when you get to to one of the pivotal scenes in there and he just kills a major character and you're like how did that happen and then you're wondering if anybody's safe after that and so it's kind of it's certainly a hard line to walk and, and I'll be honest that I'm still learning of, of how you keep that tension in there how you keep a, the reader guessing in the back of your mind and without murdering a character and have somebody talk stalk you on Twitter for the rest of your life in anger so I, I'll let Brad answer that part. <laughs> No, I actually the uh, uh, that's one of my questions. I'm I'm gonna wait because I have a question for you. Fair enough. Fair it's enough. That actual theme. Over I mean, to you, Mr. Taylor. All right. So, I actually the first thing is you're not wearing a pearly snap shirt. So <laughs> not today. That the way that you you're going from Matt Drake to <laughs> Jack Ryan Jr. is yes. Snap, Different. Exactly right. Exactly right. You must have been a special forces officer that your powers of, right. of observation unparalleled, unparalleled. So uh, what I want to do is I'm going to start talking about the book first and then talk about the writing process itself. Sure. And so I yeah, obviously I, I finished the book yesterday. Fabulous book, by the way. Thank you. Um, Thank you. And I, I the uh, I will say this is the first Jack Ryan book I've read. So Jack Ryan Jr. book. So yep. I used yep. to read Clancy a long time ago. And sure. so if you don't mind, I think it's eight books. Is that right? Yeah, that's Jack right. Ryan Jr. That's series. right. Yep. So um, anyway, I know Jack Ryan Sr. We all know yep. him from Hunt for yep. Red October, some of all fears, Patriot Games, you name yep. it. He's there. Now he's a president. Yep. So if you give us a little synopsis, uh, and what I want to tell the crowd is that you can definitely read it as a standalone because I haven't read any yep. of them. And yep. I read this one, had no issues whatsoever with understanding what was going on. But for the crowd, could you just give me a synopsis of how sure. did Jack Ryan Jr. end up where he is now and what he's doing? Sure. So, so Jack Ryan Jr. is obviously um, the son of Jack Ryan Sr. And um, he, he first came on the stage, or, or as he came on the stage, was part of an organization called The Campus, which was an off-the-books intelligence organization um, that was meant to kind of to augment, you know, much like what you did it, do in the task force or, or probably what a lot of thrillers writers do, because as you said, it's, we had this great conversation beforehand and, and, you know, to steal one of your lines, if you wrote like what you did in real life, you'd have 500 pages of PowerPoint slides and then not do the mission at the end of it. And so to get around that, writers for a long time have been, have been inventing, you know, shadowy organizations or, or paramilitary organizations that, that exist outside the National Command Authority, if you will. And so the campus is one of them. And Jack Ryan Jr. originally started on the white side of the campus, if you will, as a financial analyst. And so being who he is and that he, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit yesterday, and this is something of, of what I reflected on when I started this book is, is what is it like to be Jack Ryan Jr. and your dad is literally Superman. So so your dad is the guy who started off as a CIA analyst who somehow ended up on a stolen Russian submarine and saved the day there and, you know, and, and everything and, and became vice president only out of, or president rather, only out of this incredibly horrible situation where the entire cabinet was killed off in a, in a plane crash and stuff. And so he's the ultimate guy who isn't a politician, is there for the right reasons, does the right thing all the time, and you're his son. You know, how do you live up to that? How do you, how do you live in the shadow of the greatest hero America's ever known? Well, what you do is you start as a financial analyst and you say, you know what, this isn't enough for me. This isn't enough for me as my father's namesake. I want to do 
do things um, that are more like what my dad did with, you know, surrounded by these iconic people like Ding Chavez and John Clark. And so what you see with the Jack Ryan Jr. books is very much that journey where he goes from being a financial analyst and he has, you know, most of the other characters, your Pike Logan character was, was a member of, of um, a special mission unit before. Most of these characters have that history. Jack Ryan Jr. doesn't have any of that. And so he literally has to earn his spurs as he's going through and, and his training is some of the best, you know, best people in the world. But in the back of his mind, he's always trying to rationalize, is this me? Am I here on my own skills? Or is it because my last name is Ryan and my dad happens to be president, right? And so it goes from some occasional missions or things that he pushes the boundaries on to now he's he's you know sort of a full-fledged member of the campus, but he's always trying to prove himself and say, I really should be here on my own merits right now. I should be here. Because again, if you look at the rest of the folks who are even in the campus, you have people who are former you know, special mission units or from the intelligence community or people, for lack of a better term, who belong there, who, who got there through selection or through something else, but they have the background to justify being there and he doesn't. And so you know, being Jack Ryan Jr., the way he goes about solving that is I'm going to outwork everybody else. I'm going to prove that I earned my spot there. And so that's something that you see get touched on um, at different points in the other series in his progression. But it was something that I really wanted to dig into in this book, just because me as a new writer for this series, I wanted to be able to climb inside of his head and say, what makes this guy tick? Like, what is he thinking about? And that was one of the obvious things, you know, one of the things, um, a, a mutual friend of ours that Jason Beefley that served in the same organization you did, he had the saying that says you're always in selection, which means every day when you go to work, you have to prove that you belong there, right? And so I really kind of grabbed hold of that. And I said, I think that's what motivates Jack Ryan Jr. And so how can we explore that a little more in this book? Yeah, actually, they, uh, we talked about, you didn't know this, Barbara, but uh, Don was at my house last weekend. So he was, we he were, didn't know that. He told me. Frantically yeah, I'm looking. Trivia. I'm going to throw my trivia out there that Don didn't even know about. So Ding Chavez was in 317 Infantry, and Don thought mm -hmm. it was just made up. I did. 317 Infantry is in the 1st Brigade of the 7th Infantry Division. I was in 421 in 1st Brigade, 7th Infantry Division, when Tom Clancy came to do his research. He didn't pick 421. He picked 317, which is a mistake on his part. <laughs> So that's my connection to Tom Clancy. He was on the compound running around when I was a second lieutenant doing his research for a clear and present danger. And so it could have been, what was, what was the motto of your battalion? We were the Gimlets. We had it from yeah. 1917. They turned into ninjas because the battalion yeah. commander was like, let's take it to a vote. I don't even want to go to that. So Dean Chavez could have been a Gimlet. And it, was, it was, it was this close. Yeah. We did the same things they did. Same thing. Yeah, I mean, they're battalion, our sister battalion, 417, 317, and 421. Mm -hmm. um, so there's, but in this book, and you just kind of touched on it, there's yeah. not a lot of campus activity. It's more the yeah. old buy with through asset right. and uh, um, uh, allies, that kind of stuff. And so that, right. that was by design. Yeah, it was. when. So my editor is Tom Colgan for both my Matt Drake series and this book. And he's, he's a fantastic guy to work with. And um, which is great on a number of, of levels. And, and so one of them being, you know, I came into this was with quite a bit of trepidation because this is not only Tom Clancy's I iconic universe that you get to write in, but the writers before me that Barbara kind of, Barbara, you just tossed out there, like Mike Madden is a fantastic writer. Mark Greeny is a fantastic writer. Mark Cameron writes now. And all three of those guys, I know um, some better than others. And so Part of it is like, man, you've been given this chance to write in the Tom Clancy universe, and you're literally standing on the shoulders of giants of these incredible writers before you. And so what, what can I do um, to build upon what they've done, but is it also a little bit different? And so part of it, as I came into this, again, kind of what I said before, and in my head, it was, or in my mind, it was my job to get into Jack Ryan Jr.'s head, figure out what makes him tick kind of on a visceral level. And explore that both as I was I was writing the book and then it kind of grew into that for the book. And so one of the questions I posed to Tom Colgan as we were spitballing what the book was about, I said, look, the campus is this amazing organization. You have all these iconic characters like, 
you know, John Clark, who's, who was a, a Navy SEAL back in Vietnam, who had, you know, Without Remorse, that I think is still everybody's favorite Clancy book, and Ding Chavez that you talked about, or Mary Pat Foley, who was, you know, a case officer in the CIA, who was literally running an asset in the Kremlin at the, at the time. So you, you have all these iconic characters who, who deserve to be on stage and were created there, and then you have Jack Ryan Jr., and he has all of these assets normally that he can fall back on. But what I pitched from for Tom originally, just so for my benefit, so that I could concentrate on Jack Ryan Jr. as a character is what if we engineered a scenario where he can't fall back on any of those things? And, and that was, again, selfishly somewhat for me so that I could really just focus on him. But on the other hand, it then opens up this really interesting thing for him because in his mind up until this point, you're always in selection, you're always in selection, but he can't get away from the fact that his last name is Ryan, his dad's president. And without that connection, he would have never gotten the chance to be there in the first place, right? And so you are you have to be thinking, do I deserve to be here? Do I actually have the skill set to be here? And so I really wanted to give him the chance to find out. And the way it seemed to me to go about doing that would be to cut him off from any of the the life vests, any of the reach backs, anything that he normally, you know, could depend on and say, okay, man, if you really think you deserve to be a part of the campus, if you really think you earned your spot, well, now it's time to put up or shut up. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. Um, the, the, you start the prologue off with the special forces ODA though. Yeah. And the uh, team leader is a former Apache pilot. Is that a coincidence? <laughs> Well, so the way this works in the Army, and Brad knows this, and so I just want to help the rest of um, Barbara's viewers understand, every organization has an apex, has like the, the cream of the crop, the absolute best. And in the Army, those people are called Apache pilots. And so what <laughs> happens is when... when <laughs> All right, that's, that's not necessarily true, um, but the uh, when I when I was in Afghanistan, my front seater at the time uh, was was a great guy. He was a junior captain, and when we were much much kind of like what you said before, if you wrote a book about what actually happened in a combat deployment, ninety percent of it would be really boring stuff where you're flying around looking for trouble, and trouble isn't to be found, and so on some of those long six or seven hour missions where we're just escorting Blackhawks from fob to fob. He said, you know what? I'm going to go to selection when I'm done. And I'm like, dude, you, <laughs> there is no way. Because the other thing about Apache pilots, in addition to them being incredibly good looking human beings, is that they get to sleep in a cot. They get warm meals. You get this thing called flight pay. And the best part is when you open your tent and yes, we get to sleep in a tent and you look outside and you're like, it's kind of rainy it looks cold. I'm going back to bed. We can try it again tomorrow. And so in special forces, I've heard you actually don't have that luxury. And so I thought he was making it all up. And sure as, sure, sure enough, when we got done, he went to selection, um, went through selection, was selected, went through the Q course and became an A team leader in 10th mountain group. And so I called him up and I said, hey, man, I'm writing a Clancy book. I want to steal you and put it, put you in there. Are you okay with that? He said, as long as you make me the sexy man that all Apache pilots are. And I said, I can do that. So that's how it happened. Wow, I didn't know it was a real story. I know yeah. it was all you. <laughs> <laughs> so that, I, I do want to say, that, so the opening scene, you've got the, the prologue, you've got the ODA sure. out there. And this is more of a writing kind of question. But um, there's a Cuds Force General there. He's clearly yep. based on General Soleimani. Yes, yep, that's he, he sure talks is. about EFPs in Iraq and everything yep. else. Yep. And um, did his death happen while you were writing it, or? And for the audience, we drone yeah. strike that guy. He's dead now. Yeah. So it it happened before I because he came. I knew I wanted to have a, have a Kuds Force guy, and I'm like Soleimani would be the perfect guy for this because of everything that we just laid out. And so his death um, happened somewhere in, in there, in, in that. But from my perspective, the average American does not really know the harm that that man caused and what he fermented across Iraq that, you know, before what was, what's very interesting is before September 11th, the majority of Americans were not killed by Sunni terrorists at all. They were actually killed by Sunni Shias and, and many of them were Kuds force operatives. And so I think it, you, you might know this better than I, I think it was Petraeus or somebody that said once 
that if we were going to go to war with another nation in the Middle East, we didn't, shouldn't have picked Iraq. We, we picked the wrong one, right? And so even though he was, he was met, got his just dues during while I was writing the book, I'm like, man, he's still such a compelling character. And most people know so little about him. I'm going to grab hold of him and still base this character on him. So absolutely. So you didn't alter your writing style at all. Because I've, I've had guys, there was a uh, bomb maker in Yemen that I put in a book and then we drone striked him and I took him out <laughs> and he came up on a video still alive and I put him back in and I was like, <laughs> No, I don't. I don't. I don't let um, what the truth actually get in the way of a good story. So I'm not at all concerned by that. <laughs> so the, let's talk the opening because there's a, a yeah sort of trade craft that goes on. It's that that showcasing Jack's skills, his ability to yep. read people around a room. He knows something bad's going on. Yep. Uh, something bad does go on, but has nothing to do with the mission he's on. It's almost yeah. uh, Patriot Games. It's setting him up for an opening. Yeah. To yeah. cause a mission to, to start, um, yep. but it's not um, based on the mission he's on. It's kind of that's a right. game thing. Was that intentional or? You know, that, that's really interesting because you're the second person that brought it up, and it was certainly not intentional. But when the first person asked me, and I can't, I can't remember if it was a comment that came in on my website or, or something like that, I had to sit and go back and think about that because. Patriot Games, I think, is one of the iconic openings for this Clancy book because it does such a good job of showcasing who Jack Ryan is, and it launches them in, you know, into um, the, as you said, kind of the adventure, and it spins it off on there. And so it wasn't intentionally about that. What it was more about is is folks with Jack Ryan's background, with with your background, with with people who are in law enforcement or case officers, people whose job it is to read other people for a living tend to be hyper aware. And so what that, the way that that manifests, right, is that you're, you're constantly taking, whether you mean to or not, one of my friends um, that I go to church with is, is a cop in his day job. And when you sit in church nine times in the 10, he's walking back to the back at some point, because there's something about crowds that keys him off and, and he wants to be at a, at the access control point. If there's something going on, if somebody's being loud or something, because you're trained to do that way. And so Jack Ryan, the same thing. At that point, he's, he's working as, as a, on loan to the CIA and helping do this asset validation exercise. And so even though what he's supposed to be monitoring is over here and is something completely different, because he's been trained to be hyper aware, he picks up something and keys off that and says, this is the greater threat. And because of who he is, he sees the danger that's there and he moves to interdict. And so it wasn't... Um, it wasn't intentionally an homage to the Patriot to um, Patriot Games at the beginning of that, but I may start claiming that going forward because it makes me sound much smarter than I am. So that's my answer to that. Well, talk through the opening there because you, you put a lot of yeah. thought in the, the, the validation exercise. And I did. Yeah. So so my job um, when I was an FBI special agent, one of my first jobs was to be a human guy, and so. What your job entails is running and recruiting what we call sources or what folks in the intelligence communities call assets. And so when you, and what that means is it can be something um, not, I, I don't mean to use the word benign, but something that sounds a whole lot less sexy. Like if we're running a case against a, um, a drug organization and we need somebody that's inside that tells us, here's how the drugs actually come from this distribution point to this. And so you look for a source that you can recruit that has that information all the way to, you know, maybe a national questioning. Like you're looking for somebody who has access to um, somebody within the Free Syrian Army or somebody who's working on the WMD program for North Korea or something like that. And so your first job is to find somebody who has that access, right? Your second part of that job is you're doing kind of that assessment as you're looking and saying, what does that person want or need and how can I provide it for them? And then the third part is, are they trainable? And all those things go together. And the trainable part is very, very important because if you're a case officer in the intelligence community or you're an FBI special agent that does it, you've had training. If you're a case officer, you've gone to the farm, you've learned how to run and recruit sources, you've learned how to do brush passes or Covcom or all of the things that are part of the the espionage craft, if you will. An asset doesn't have any of that training. And you actually do a great job with that in American Trader, where you have your main, your main bad guy there, or your main trader 
is belittled by the Chinese because of because he is a clueless asset who has no training and is constantly getting into trouble. And that's a real life thing that happens. And so part of you, what you're doing is that evaluation. Can I train this person to do what's necessary to provide me the information I need without them getting compromised or killed in the process? And so if you have either a really deep question about that or some other burning question about the asset or source, what you might do is structure what's called an asset validation exercise where you get together with a couple of other folks and say, okay, let's come up with a scenario that is completely self-contained, but it's hidden from the actual asset. So they think it's real life. You're giving them a tasking to go do something. I need you to grab this. Here's your window. Here's the surveillance detection route you're gonna do. And you're gonna meet with this person. All of that is contrived and is built just for the purpose of observing that person's performance, right? Because you want to know whether they have the chops to pull that off before your life is in danger, their life is in danger, or, or something worse than that. And so that's the opening scene of Target Acquired is Jack is serving as an observer for an asset validation exercise um, that the CIA is running. And he's actually doing it in Ding Chavez's place, which is a huge deal to Jack because Ding, is, in addition to being a ninja, which is an infinitely cooler name than Gimlets or whatever you were called, the, he, is, he is wanted to have you know, Ding's approval his entire life. And this is Ding saying, hey, you go do this thing. I have faith in you. You got the chops to pull this off. Go do this operation. And so as he's doing it, something else happens at the same time, and he has to deviate, and, and that changes the course of the book. Yeah, right. That starts the explosion of- um, That's right. Now I got a mission. And so he gets picked up by the Shin Bet. And now this yep. is the question that Barb was asking. So you you there's a character in the book that you eliminate. Yep. For lack of a better term. Uh, <laughs> and it's not the it's not the second lieutenant Star right. Trek guy as soon as he walks on screen. You're like, that guy's dead. Red uniform going down. You know that. <laughs> you put a lot of time and effort into the uh, um, development of the character. I did. And uh, I, did. I was shocked when he or she disappeared I I'm did. not being his way but no 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 I you plan you know, that out as you were writing I mean when you started did you no. say I'm gonna do that no no I absolutely didn't and and for me it's and and I haven't I know what what I love is listening to like you and Mark Graney and some of the folks who have been doing this for a long time saying man I'm, I'm 10 books or 14 books into it and I wish I hadn't done this five books ago and, and unfortunately i am in the three books in i don't i don't have that experience yet and so maybe this will be one of the things where it's i wish i had done this but you know as i was writing the book and and for me it's always that struggle between you need to be able to have the reader live in fear in some way or another right like you write pike logan first person and so the, the reader in the back of their mind thinks this is the guy that's telling the story. He can't die, but you right. put him in situations where you're like, yeah, maybe this one bike doesn't come home from. And so one of the ways that you do that is the stakes have to be real. And, this, and the stakes are real when a character dies. And so it wasn't something that I intended to. And honestly, it was something that caused me quite a bit of trepidation. And I went through it a couple of times and I'm like, you know what? this is right for the story. And I think this is what I have to do. So hopefully I, I won't be, I won't be you in five years saying, man, I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> I wish you'd have whacked to the guy to the right. <laughs> He's kind of a jerk. <laughs> yeah. yeah and, uh, the, the, you've clearly been to Tel Aviv multiple times. Yeah. Yeah. And, I love Tel Aviv. I, mean, I recognize a lot of spots in there. I actually had to Google a lot of spots. And I'm like, really? Yeah. I've never been there. Uh, how is the research different? Because you do go to Beirut and Syria, and Beirut yeah. has just as much detail as as Tel Aviv does. I appreciate that. I have I've been very very lucky in that for the last nine years I've worked um, with Israeli companies off and on, and so I've gotten to go to Tel Aviv um, twice. The, I'm actually just transitioning to writing full time now, and the company I was working before was a um, a uh, Israeli owned company that we worked for, and so. Something to look, before I get to that, a little aside about Israelis and Israel. So Israel is is um, probably one of my favorite countries in the world. The people are incredibly kind. They speak great English. They love Americans. 
Um, they're also a democracy that's that's surrounded by enemies for the most part. And there's a lot of commonality between Israelis and, and Americans. Another thing that makes um, Israelis a little bit different is in the U.S. So if you are making if you're working for Boeing chance and you're an engineer for Boeing, chances are you've never served in the military. And that's just because, you know, less than, you know, half of one percent of, of the U.S. population has served in the military. In Israel, every single Israeli serves in some form or fashion in between the time between they graduate high school and when they um, start college or move on with their life. And so what that does is give Israelis a unique perspective into what it's like. So if you're designing a, a particular piece of kit or a site or a weapon, chances are they may not have been from the special operations community or something, but they've held a weapon or they've been in the military and it gives them a very unique um, part to it. And so Tel Aviv, I was fortunate enough to, to visit a number of times. And, and like what you said in the last interview about, you know, No Fortunate Son, where you got to set a book in a place you really, really liked. I'm like, man, I want to set this book in Israel because there's so many, and I love the country. I love Tel Aviv. And there's so many interesting things that can happen there. And so I did take a lot of time, you know, both drawing on my memories and talking to my Israeli friends about different things uh, within Tel Aviv. Now, I have not had the um, pleasure of visiting Beirut, Lebanon, and so that one does become infinitely harder because you're, I did a lot of Google um, search and a lot of Google images. Fred Burton's got that great book called Beirut Station um, that does, um, you know, explores, it's kind of a primer on the whole Shia influence in Lebanon that, that led to some very, very tragic um, events, and so I relied a lot on that, but tried to, you know, you were you were talking before too about the amount of detail that you put in a book and that there are some things that find you versus things that you're looking for. And I think those are when a reader goes through what makes a place real for them is those touchstone things. Like you talked about with, with Barbara, that tree house that you found that you just kind of stumbled on. And, and so I tried to find things like that in Beirut that, that said, hey, here are things where if you've been here before that I've read a bunch of blogs on people that travel that you could grab a hold and, and try and add for the atmospheric. So certainly a whole lot easier for, for Tel Aviv um, than Beirut, but I appreciate that, that you thought I got them both right. No, I did. And I, actually, there's when I did Syria, there's a book called Road to Fatima Gate, which is mm -hmm. about the Arabic Spring in Syria. And I was supposed to go to Syria, and of course, the Arabic Spring happened. And my yep. butt was a D, the uh, uh, um, defense attache inside the embassy, had my visa, I was going to go. And then they closed the embassy down, everybody evacuated, and I couldn't go. So I had to rely on yep. the book. And I agree completely with the uh, military thing. And, you know, people ask about the difference between the CIA and the military, and we're always at loggerheads. Yep. Well, most yep. of Mossad have served in, I mean, not just did a two-year tour, but most of the people yep. who worked in Mossad served in the military for 10 years. They're much closer yep. than we are because they, they all yep. did the same thing. That's right. That's right. That's right. Um, the, the one thing I want to say is that you did use, um, <laughs> actually, that's right. <laughs> Just about every single intelligence agency in the world. <laughs> so you've got the Russian SVR, Shin Bet, the Mossad, Chinese MSS, CIA. I was waiting on North Korea to pop up. Uh, was that something that just happened along the way? Or did you, I mean, did you plan that out and say, I'm going to put all these different people? It was all done really well. Don't get me wrong. Um, every one of them that was in there, there's a reason for them being in there. It wasn't just throwing yeah. something in there just to throw them in there. There was an absolute reason why this person's in there. But did you plan that out before you started or halfway through you said, you know, I'm going to throw this in there? So a little bit of both. When I when I was going through, like I said, kind of necking down the book about when you narrow the scope about of the book to, to one person, then what you have to do to carry the book is the complexity of what they're doing has to increase exponentially to carry it, right? Because otherwise, if it's just about Jack Ryan and about Junior and about that one portion of the story – then that's probably not enough to carry the book itself. And so I knew I wanted to have a whole bunch of misdirection on in there. And I wanted to have things get like, as he peels back the onion, things get less clear instead of more clear. And so the way that that ended up happening is that there's a woman um, called De Dr. Becca Schweigert that figures very, very prominently in the book. And um, what starts is something very simple in, in the first scene with Jack Ryan Jr., where he stops her um, attempted assassination, 
spirals into something very, very complex. And once I kind of hit on what it is she knew that everybody wanted, then it became a logical next step to say, well, hell, everybody would want that if they knew that she had that. And then that gave me the opportunity to bring in all these other different intelligence organizations who are also in the same time kind of in the hunt for this woman. So that that is um, how it's kind of the spray and pray um, uh, <laughs> philosophy that you throw a bunch of stuff out there and hope that some of it sticks. Well, I'll tell you this, there's a little, uh, there's a, some geopolitical depth there that you don't really see in the Clancy novels in the past, especially at the tactical sure. level. I mean, there's a, you have a healthy discussion about uh, shared interests of allies, yep. but not necessarily shared goals. I mean, yep. Jack's working with Israelis, but he has no illusions right. about their commitment. That's and right. uh, that's very real. I mean, you, you're always working, even if you're doing five eyes stuff, but especially with Israelis, right. you're like, yeah, I'll help you out, but what's your goal here? That's right. That's right. And that, you know, and that was something that, so there have been two big rifts in Israeli and American relations. And so the first one happened, I think it was in the late eighties or early nineties, where there was a uh, Israeli air force um, officer who was running an asset in America. And I, and I can't remember if it was jet engines or something like that, but this asset took American technology and exported it to Israel. And it was this whole blow up, like, how could we do that? How could the Israelis do that? You know, and it set relations back a tremendous amount. The second one was much more recent in which a Israeli, so the other thing that's interesting about Israel is Tel Aviv, like I said, is that milica, mili, uh, mili, <laughs> minim, minimum um, uh, miniature, thank you, is the word I'm trying to say, Silicon Valley. And, and from a defense perspective, it's even more so because because everybody serves in the IDF, because the IDF, um, especially the special mission units, are constantly going out and dealing with the enemies that surround them, the ideation um, loop is very, very small. So if I come up with a product, I can literally give it to the IDF, who will go test it, come back, give you real-time feedback on that, and you're able to develop that better product. And so they have some tremendous capabilities from a technology standpoint, but a very, very small market for them, right? Because Israel's a tiny country. And so what do they do? They look where else in the world can I sell this? And so there was an Israeli drone, an armed drone that the company had made and said, hey, you know, they came to America and said, hey, we want to sell this. And America said, that's ah, not for us. And they said, well, we've had your interest from China. How about we sell it to China? And the U.S. said, no, nah, we don't think that's a good idea. And somehow the wires were crossed where the Israeli came back and said, well, ah! and, and this is something funny my Israeli counterparts say is that when American says no, they mean no. When an Israeli tells you no, what they really mean is maybe. And so that guy came back with it and said, yeah, he said no, but they probably meant maybe. And so they sold this thing to China and that blew up as well, right? And set it back. And so it, it just, and that's not a, a meant to be a hit on Israel or anything else, but at the end of the day, nations should and will they're going to go after their own interests. And so you're going to have shared interests, but you're never going to have alliances because at the end of the day, frankly, the government of Israel, their job is to take care of the Israeli people. And the government of America, their job is to take care of Americans. Hopefully those, those two goals align more than they differ, but they're absolutely going to differ from time to time. Yeah, I completely agree. I really like that part of the story because I, I've worked with the Israelis when I was still in the military. Yep. And uh, there was a lot of times when it was kind of like, okay, are we talking the same language here? What are you about to do? And there were plenty of times when, oh, yep. yeah, you're all on board, you're all on board, we're going to do this, and boom, something yep. will happen. You're like, you didn't yep. tell us you were about to do this. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Because yep. they, they had their own thing going on. Absolutely. Okay, I want to get to, because we're going to run out of time here. The climax of your book is what I would call ambitious. <laughs> I would say there's so much stuff happening in the climax and I'm holding the book in my hand which is you know I've got about this much left and I'm like how in the hell is he going to wrap up this book with this much stuff going on there's stuff going everywhere I mean did you just simply say to yourself I'm just going to write myself in the corner and then go cry <laughs> well, I I explored the, and Jack Ryan Jr. wakes up and it was all a dream. And I, the Tom Colgan didn't really seem to go for that. And so, you know, I was, so as it was coming together, I had, I had an idea for, there's, there's a sequence in there that, um, 
that has a, a character that's an F-35 pilot that I had written out completely and loved and thought, I don't think I can do this. Like, I don't think it's going to, it's going to detract too much from the final culmination because the culmination <laughs> itself, as you said, there are probably at least five different points of view oh, yeah. that are all I happening know. at the same time. And so I had at one point, you know, across the entire floor of my office, just note cards and note cards, because you're trying to sequence and you had to do this. We were talking when I was at your house, you had to do the same thing with American Trader, where you had a scene happen from one point of view, yeah. and then the same scene happened. And how do you sequence that without taking away the, the suspense for the reader? Yeah, exactly. And so I wrestled, it is by far the most, you know, the hardest part of any book that I've ever written and I didn't for a long time I didn't think I was going to be able to pull it off because you want to do the climaxes where you're given the payoff to the reader for the 300 plus pages that they spent with you and it's kind of like you know the grand finale at the, at the end of a right. fireworks show like stay to the end and I promise you it's going to be incredible and so as I was doing that as you're there's a pacing itself that goes in part of in 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 the climax right is and that so where the uh, uh the cross came in no more spoilers. <laughs> so that may have been the part that i was most uh most dreading what mr colgan would say and so when i got back his his reader comments on it i went to that one as fast as i could and i got to that page and looked and he's like you're a maniac and he's like but i like it and i'm like oh my gosh and Ange was actually standing over my shoulder and she's like does he know what he what you did and I'm like I, I think he does now and so it you know it 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 stretched Jack Ryan in ways that he hasn't been stretched before and so I, I appreciate you saying in that it was it was the hardest quite frankly it was the hardest thing that I've ever done but I had Tom Colgan a lot of times will reference Mark Graney because you know, he's been with Mark since Mark first wrote The Gray Man, you know, however many years ago. And, and one of the times he was talking about Mark and writers in general, he said, you know, the difference between a good writer and a great writer is a great writer pushes the envelope with every single book. And so every time where I was trying to neck down that climax and say, maybe I should just cut this point of view, maybe I should cut this entire sequence. It was like Tom Colgan whispering in my ear, push the envelope, push the envelope. So <laughs> Hopefully it works completely out of the box. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. If, uh, it was really if, fantastic. Actually, I was like, I was kind of amazed. I was like, there's no way he's going to be able to wrap this up. <laughs> there's, there's so much stuff going on here. And there's the cross. I'm like, and the, the, and the cross. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, um, we're going to run out of time. So I'm going to skip some of these things as you probably answered. Okay, them. Brad, it's all right. We don't have a clock running. Take all the okay. time you want. All right. all right. So the I actually wanted to ask you this question. The, the Clancy books are known for technical accuracy. That's what they always yep. do. And you can, yep. uh, you know, from the ground combat, dog fights, submarines, yep. Yep. Clancy's got all that. And I could see that, I mean, obviously you're a counterintelligence agent. That You're doing sure. FDRs, you're doing um, yep. the tradecraft yep. stuff, and that's obviously easy for you. The, infill into Beirut yep. Blackhawks I'm like he's a helicopter pilot he's got that stuff but you also had a lot of decidedly Clancy fare in there with uh, <laughs> drones and aircraft and other weapon systems yeah. how'd you how'd you work that out so the the stuff with like you're um, tell me you're also an F-16 I was yes yes that was it <laughs> no so when I, when I was um when I when I came up with the idea for that for the F-35 sequence that happens um, I knew it was beyond my ability as a pilot to be able to do. And so um, luckily I had, you know, funny story when I was, when I was 13 years old and sin sitting in Sunday school, one Sunday, this kid shows up and his parents had been missionaries in Africa and he sits down next to me and, and his name's Eric Fogelin and we start talking. So fast forward, he, um, the, the school he went to, I ended up, Ange went to, and, and so I stayed in contact with him after I met then my girlfriend, now my wife, long story longer, he is now, we've stayed in contact with him because Angel's school was very, very small and he was in her graduating class. And he now works for a, a group called Mission Aviation Fellowship that flies planes in, um, he's actually in Haiti and he flies planes um, into like mountainous regions in Haiti and stuff like that to pick up sick people or folks that need to get transported. And so in between that and now he went to the Air Force Academy and he flew uh, F-16s for 
20 something years and he ended his career in scenic Las Vegas, sitting in a bunker flying um, drones. And so when I had this idea for the F-35 scene, I wrote the bare bones of it. And then I called him up and I said, hey, Eric, have I got a deal for you? And I'm like, I will put you, and I told him I put him in the acknowledgement sections of a Tom Clancy book where everybody wants to be, not knowing that we don't actually get to write acknowledgement sections for Tom Clancy books. So sorry, well, Eric, you're not pilot in there. To be a Female called Daisy, so I that really must, that must have impressed. Yes, and and he was very impressed with that. So she is actually another fun thing about writing books. So my best friend is Kelsey Smith. He and I were troop commanders in Afghanistan together. His wife is Natalie Smith, who was also an, an army officer for four years. They're still some of our dearest friends. And so I, as I'm getting Eric to help me with the details. I write Natalie Smith and say, how would you like to be an F-35 pilot in a Tom Clancy book? And so she's like, you bet your ass I would be. So that's where she came with. And then Eric was nice enough to help me um, with the air to air scenes and kind of lock that down. And then our mutual friend that I talked um, about quite a bit, Jason Beefley, when I, when I started, you know, as you said, it starts with uh, an A team and in, in a, um, in a, um, sniper hide site, you know, overwatch of a, of a target. And so I said, my original questions were just around ranges and gear. And, and Jason is such a good guy. Like he used to teach tactics with Kyle Lamb and is very, very brilliant. And so when I got on to ask him some very simple questions, an hour and a half later, I had an entire class on ballistics and why around when it goes through the sound barrier coming back down, it starts to tumble and that's bad. And so he was very, very kind and, and helped me get some of the details, hopefully right for that too. But it is, you know, all joking aside, it, it is a, a big responsibility because part of what I did when I got the opportunity to write this is go back and reread some of the early Tom Clancy books and the books that were my favorite. And, and that figures large in there, right? Like that's the guy who, you yeah. know, had you standing on the bridge of a 688 attack class sub and did that stuff and think, man, if I'm going to write in there, I gotta, I have to <laughs> up my game a little bit and actually go out and find the things that I normally avoid because I don't want to research them in my books. And so I did that and was lucky enough to rub some shoulders with some interesting people who helped me out with it. Yeah, it actually worked out really well. So I was, I was waiting on the, uh, when, as soon as I read Natalie Smith, I'm like, okay, here comes some Tom, Tom Clancy stuff going on here. <laughs> Here it comes. And actually, I had to do all the F-35 research for American Trader. Yep. So I'm like, yep. Oh, I remember all this. I read about it. <laughs> okay, I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Uh, the Clancy yeah. Universe is, uh, it's now huge. I mean, you've got two separate yeah. series. Going on. Yep. And this is more about the writing process itself. you got at least two separate threads with two separate authors, but they're using the mm -hmm. same characters. Yeah. And kind of what Barbara was talking about earlier. I mean, how do you juggle that? Yeah. I mean, so the next book you said my next book is going to be Jack Ryan Jr. loses his mind because his father's assassinated. <laughs> so you, you joke? Uh, you just killed an entire series. You, <laughs> how do you work that between the series? Because you're both using the same author, the same character. Yeah. Yeah. It's super. So so Tom Colgan serves as kind of the intermediary between. So it's me and Mark Cameron, and his books come out in the winter and mine come out in the summertime. And so there's about six months between them. And Tom Colgan does a, a pretty good job of deconflicting those. And then I get Mark's synopsis when he writes it and his first draft of his book, and he gets mine. Having said that, old Mr. Cameron in, um, in his last book, in the very um, end of it has um, Jack Ryan Jr. bring a female acquaintance home to mom and dad. And so I found out about that about 75,000 words into my book and had a completely different uh, subplot <laughs> that I had to exercise with extreme prejudice. And so I called up Mr. Mark Cameron, who uh, is a bear of a man and used to be a fugitive task force guy. And, and I very politely said, um, Mr. Cameron, uh, you kind of hosed me a little bit here. Um, <laughs> How do we prevent and no and, and what I actually said to him at the end and is like, you know, I can fix that. That's fine. But um, at the end of my book, uh, Jack Ryan Sr. has a, a stroke and is a vegetable. So good luck with that and see what you do with your next book. And so we actually talked back and forth quite a bit. And he was a gentleman and, and helped me out with some things because there was something 
I would, cause all of us think the same way, you know, all of us writers, it's funny, you and I have had the same, you know, F-35s and you had a North Korean thing when I had, and we, you know, all of us look at the world in a similar manner and it's a struggle sometimes I think when we're writing completely different books, not to have the same elements, let alone when you're writing in the same series. And there was something I was about to do that would have derailed his entire plot in his book. And to his credit, he just got very, very quiet. And he said, well, if you do that, I'm going to have to rewrite about 80,000 words. And I'm like, okay, okay, I won't do that. And so at the end of it, he's like, here's the deal. I'll write the old guys, you write the young guys. And I'm like, all right, we're sold on that. So it is, <laughs> it is something that's hard to do. And, and fortunately, Tom Colgan does a great job. And Mark Cameron is a fantastic guy to work with. Well, segueing right into this, your perfect segue to the next question, because you're now writing two books a year. Yep. And I told you before that just about broke me. But for <laughs> me, at least I was writing the same series. Yeah. Two books in the same series. And now you're writing yep. two books completely different. Yep. And you, outside of not wearing Chloe Snap shirts when you're writing <laughs> Jack Ryan Jr., how do you, uh, I mean, does Matt Drake filter into Jack Ryan Jr.? He can. One, one of the things that helps me a little bit is that Matt's voice is so distinctive and it's a first person point of view. Yeah, yeah, and true. so when I write Jack Ryan Jr., it's third person and it's, and it's different. And so it helps me separate the two in my mind. And then again, Tom Colgan helps out with that quite a bit. There's a scene, one of the scenes in Target Acquired where um, Jack Ryan Jr. is calling back to John Clark. And in the first version of that, he may have been a little bit snippier than the situation called for. And so Colgan just mashed that like a, like a bug and said, you know, that is Matt Drake talking. It's not Jack Ryan Jr. He'd never talk that way. And so he helped me kind of, you know, tighten up my shot group a little bit there and get back into Jack Ryan's head. But the other part of it, I think you and I were talking about it is you, you know, you can, you have an idea or you have a gazillion ideas as you're writing the book, right? And, and some of them you think that's a great idea, but maybe it would work better with this book. And so then you're tempted to say, do I leave that for the next book? Do I, and yeah. I talked to Mark, Mark, and you've obviously had to do that too, just within your own series. And I remember talking to Mark Graney about it and his take is like down that path, madness lies. Like if you're trying to segregate in totally your mind agree. right then. Yeah. So I've tried to resist that urge um, for the most part, but it, it's still something I have to work through. But I guarantee what's going to end up happening is you've given away something in Jack Ryan Jr. Yep. You're like, man, yep. I really wish I could use that in Matt yep. Drake. Yep. Like, yeah, you, you were beating me up on that when we were talking about let it in your house. Let me like, ask a question. Did, what do, would yeah. it really make any difference? Do you, do you feel that everybody is reading both your books or do you have one audience for Tom Clancy and perhaps a different audience for Matt and therefore it wouldn't really matter that much if there was some overlap? I mean, I don't know. This is probably one of those data-driven things that yeah. you know publishers would need to drill down to, but... I think there certainly is some thought that, you know, that you might have different readerships and therefore I, I, you don't have to be so worried about it. Sure, sure. Well, I certainly hope that the folks who are Tom Clancy fans come over to the Matt Drake series because they, they like how I've written it. And certainly I know I've gotten folks who were Matt Drake fans that said, hey, I hadn't read a, a, a Jack Ryan Jr. book before, but I know you're taking him over and so I'm going to read it. But if we're going to be brutally honest, like the Venn diagram from Clancy sitting up here and Matt Drake is this little tiny pin brick down here right now, there's a much, much bigger audience for, for Tom Clancy and, and certainly always will be. But I think what I think what Brad was alluding to is we, and I was joking with him, is that the difference between what we do as thriller writers and what writers who write fantasy do is that in fantasy, you use magic to solve really hard problems. We right. use technology that we make up. And so what Brad was beating me up on is like, he did this really cool technology thing in Tom Clancy and you can never use it for Matt Drake now. It's gone, it's gone, he loves gotcha. Clancy. And that, those, that's probably a legitimate thing. But then I'll just go back to the Mark Graney philosophy of hopefully future Don comes up with another device that's just as cool as that one. So we'll see. That's an interesting point about, about the magic. I have got Jim mm -hmm. Rollins' new January science fiction thriller while mm -hmm. Sigma Force is sitting over on the side somewhere here for a little while. And mm -hmm. um, 
and I'm, I'm going to be, I haven't had time to read it yet. Um, it's only like 600 pages, so I don't know why I haven't knocked it off, but um, <laughs> I'll be interested to see whether what you just said is true. You know, yeah. that, that magic yeah. and so forth comes into play. I wanted to ask you, we need to call Patrick up, but I wanted to ask you whether there's been any um, leak in or effect or anything from the two movies that were made. Yeah, so people ask me about that and ask, um, you know, what do I, what did I think about the movies? What, are, you know, what are they, you know, I, I, which movies are we talking about? Are you talking about the, um, without, without uh, remorse? Is that what you mean? No, I thought, aren't there two recent Jack Ryan TV movies or whatever it is? Oh, yeah, yeah. So that's, that's what I am talking about. So one of them, I think, is the Amazon series that you're talking yeah. about that, Yep, and then there was without remorse that Michael B. Jordan um, did as as uh, but Amazon the, series Jack Ryan Senior. It's not Junior. Yeah, it's that's him. right. It's, it's just yeah, but he's young. I mean, yeah, he's exactly. very yeah. very young. So yeah. I think that that leads to some confusion in the viewer's mind. Yeah. Anyway, no, you, no, you're right about that because when when people ask me about about the book stuff, I say that Jack Ryan Junior is the same age as Jack Ryan Senior is in the Amazon things, basically. <laughs> like this, and they're like, "What?" And it is, it is. You're right. There are there are folks who have asked about um, that or, or kind of get confused between the two. But I think, I don't know. I, I just think that the 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 Clancy um, universe is so big, and there's so many things there that hopefully if you know somebody likes the Amazon one and comes over to the books or vice versa that there's crossover but it is a little just because in the books as you allude to you know Jack Ryan senior is in such a different place in life than oh. he's portrayed in the Amazon ones for sure it might be a bigger problem for Mark I wasn't asking you to yeah. evaluate the movie I'm just wondering yeah, yeah. The expectations that are created mm. by people who watch the yeah. movie who are not yeah. I might add necessarily people who will ever read a book yeah, no, yeah, that's that a fair isn't point. always always the case. Um, but I wondered if that had some. Maybe that's a question I'll save up for Mark in yeah. December, and we'll see. Yeah. Patrick, you want to come back and join us? I'm going to weave you. There he is. Isn't this fun? Sure. I'm doing it. Yay! Yeah, what you got to contribute, kid. It was a great conversation. Um, let's see. I'm trying to I'm trying to get people to ask more questions, but uh, let let's see. A couple of the people that were. Uh, that we're watching the previous, our discussion with, with Brad. Um, a guy named Joshua, he says, for Don and Brad, thank you for your uh, iconic, epic, and influential novels. Uh, your work has been greatly inspiring to myself as I finish writing my own first novel. Ooh. Who were your literary influences when you first started writing? Thank you both for your service to our great country. I feel like as the senior writer, by far, you should start out with that one, Brad. I'd say that the literary influences for me would span every genre. I've read them all. I mean, I read Stephen King. I, uh, you know, Nelson DeMille, John Corey was a big influence. Uh, John Sanford, um, just about every genre there is outside of romance, I guess. Uh, I don't, I don't have a single person that I look to and said that's what I'm going to emulate. I tried to, I write what I, my first book, I wrote what I'd want to read. And so I looked at all the books I'd read and I wrote what I thought I'd like to read. That's what I tried to do. And they taught me how to, to write basically, because I was like, they do this well, I'm going to try to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. I think for me, so even though it sounds like a canned answer, Tom Clancy was the first, the first um, author I read that was kind of my gateway drug to this genre. It was Red Storm Rising. A buddy of mine down the street gave it to me when I was 13 or 14 years old, and it just it just drew me in. And that was that was at the time when a lot of people were writing kind of those epic military thrillers. So you had and I know you've talked about Ralph Peters before, Barbara. So Ralph Peters was writing some great books. Yeah. You had um, Harold Harold Coyle who wrote Team Yankee. You had Larry Bond who wrote Red Phoenix, and so. I started Nelson on the Nelson DeMille and the Charm School. Nelson DeMille, Don't Charm that out. School. One of my totally favorite books. Yeah. Nelson DeMille with Charm School and for me, um, Nelson DeMille, like, like Brad, his John Corey series because of that, you know, very unique first person protagonist voice. Vince Flynn um, was when I was trying to get better at being a writer, Vince Flynn was my, my favorite uh, writer and, and Kyle Mills has done a fantastic job taking over that scene. But there was 
my favorite Vince Flynn book, I think was Transfer of Power at the time. And when I couldn't figure out why my novel wasn't working, I actually took note cards and mapped out that entire novel. And much to my wife's chagrin, I stuck it on our bedroom wall because we lived in a really small house and I didn't have an office. And just to stand back and watch what he did and how he did it. And when Mitch Rapp came in, when the antagonist came in, what the pacing was. So he was a huge influence on me as well. And then, you know, the, the folks who write today, um, so many good ones. But Daniel Silva, I think, is, is the best at creating characters that you want to come back to book after book after book. And so his, you know, honestly, when I get to read the next Daniel Silva book, it feels like um, I'm coming home because I get to hang out with the company the characters that I love that I've invested you know how many hours and how many books into reading so those are a couple for me you've got four weeks to go I do and then the the next the the cellist right is that his new one yeah yep it is I agree with you I I think he's wonderful on character but he's also terrific on on background I mean he really does bring you into the places that he is writing about in a in a different way because they are not there's a lot less mili- there's no real military action, although there's certainly right. action scenes, but it's a it's a different. I think I think he and Lee Child have done an amazing job. Jack Reacher, yep. you know, quintessential Western hero, written by a guy you. from Birmingham, England. Daniel Silva had to have a dictionary because he describes clothing. <laughs> <laughs> well, but, but I think the idea of Gabriel as an art restorer, you know, the the um, it's just a fabulous, yeah, um, I agree. Mm-hmm. really, as a background for, for what he does. It's just hard to, to beat that. And so I, too, am a, a big fan. We've been lucky to do all of the Gabriel Alons with, with Daniel. Um, That's awesome. Yeah, it has been. It's been a wonderful trip so far. Anything else, Patrick? Yeah, uh, our friend Tori Eldridge, uh, the writer, <laughs> she actually has an excellent question for both you guys which is, um, uh, let's see, having both served as you have, have you ever written something in fiction that hit too close to home emotionally? Mm -hmm. Uh, If so, how was that for you? Did you veer away or lean into it? I can answer that one right off the bat. So in One Rough Man, um, one of the biggest fears you had is you would, when I was still in the military, is you deploy overseas and you're the guy that's in danger and then you lose your family, which is not supposed to happen because they live in America. And I wrote that in a book, but it was off the page. And my editor, when he bought the book, said, you got to put that on the page. And I said, I, I can't put that on the page. That's not, I'm not writing that. I'm not going to write about Pike's family yep. getting killed. And he was insistent. And so I took my computer and I left the room and I wrote that scene and I just hated every minute of it. And mm-hmm. Um, it did make the book better. And so I did lean into it, but I would not have if my editor hadn't made me do it. And I did not want to write that. So for me, before I get to it, I got to give a little shout out to Tori Eldridge. So she is an incredible writer who's got the Ninja series. Uh, Her third book is coming out, I think in September. And she actually is a ninja, which makes it even cooler. She puts all (laughs) kinds of fun stuff on Facebook of her doing both staff. And anyway, so, um, I have a similar thing where when when I've heard something wise in my life that corresponds to writing, I normally attribute it to Nick Petrie because he's a he's a pretty wise guy and he's the author of the Drifter series um, with Peter Ash. And, and this one he did actually tell me at one point we were talking and he said, you know, for a, in a good book, a writer is is or the novelist is trying to answer a question for themselves in the pages of the novel, and that you got to be brave enough to write about something that uh, evokes an emotion from you or, or, or has an emotional response from you. And, and for me, the first time I did that was without sanction. So like a lot of folks who uh, have deployed overseas or have gone into combat, there you have a moment in time where things didn't go the way that you, that you wanted to. And that certainly happened for me. And with without sanction was the first time I think I was brave enough to kind of delve into that. And I made it Matt's problem because it was my problem. And I think that resonates with readers, just like Brad said, you know, the, the scene that terrified him that he wrote out that became so pivotal for one rough man. I think a lot of the comments I got on without sanction is there's a heart here um, that's different. That is, there's there's something that you're doing here that you're highlighting 
um, that isn't necessarily as common in that. And I think it is, I think Tori's spot on with that, that you have to be brave enough to put what you fear in there. And for us who serve, a lot of times what we fear comes from what we saw or what we were afraid that happened that hopefully, hopefully didn't. Great question and great answers from you guys. Um, as kind of a corollary to that, um, since you both have, you know, have that personal experience, um, do you ever come across in books, I'm sure you have, that are techno thrillers or military thrillers, where you can say, you know what, I can tell that this author doesn't have that perspective. Um, are you able to kind of see through the cracks and, and tell when something is not yeah, as authentic? I mean and it's not so much, you don't have to have the perspective per se. I mean, one of the best books, war books ever written is Red Badge of Courage and that guy never served. I mean, yeah. it's not necessarily, even people who serve can write books that don't have that perspective. And they right. think they, yeah. they do. And so it's, to me, it's more the, the ability of the writer than it is any, any way that, you know, any things you've done in your past or anything like that. Don? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think one of the, one of the things, um, one of the things that's hard to capture is that a lot of times when things are going wrong, whether it's whether it's within combat or you're in law enforcement or you're a first responder and things that happen, is that one of the ways that people cope with that a lot of times is through kind of a gallus humor. And so it's this, Definitely. even though everything's going wrong, the way I'm going to keep my sanity right here is we're going to make a stupid joke about something to relieve the tension. And so. I've seen writers do that really, really well who never served. And so I don't, I don't know if that is because they've had friends that done or do that research, but I agree with, with Brad. I mean, some of the, the great novelists in this genre right now, you know, we talked before about, you know, Vince, Finn, Vince Flynn or Brad Thor or Daniel Silva or in, in obviously Jack, you know, Jack Reacher, Lee Child is more um, crime fiction, but none of those guys ever served, but they were able to capture the essence of that and, and what it meant so that, so that it was believable. And I think that's what, what our job is as writers. Let's see, uh, Jennifer has a couple of questions. She says, uh, hey Brad, how does it feel to be the, the veteran now? Seems like just yesterday, one rough man came out. <laughs> I'll tell you, nobody's more surprised than me. <laughs> <laughs> and then she says, Don, looking forward to the book. And then she says, Patrick, get in, in the mail ASAP. So I better, I better run downstairs and, uh, and do that. I like Jennifer. <laughs> yes, you sure, because we're almost out. So you know, you don't, you don't want to disappoint her. Is there anything else, Patrick, that you want to highlight? Oh, um, just a well. There's there's a nice comment. You know, a couple of readers that were at Brad's discussion just previous to this <clears throat> weren't as familiar with your work, Don, and that you've been mm -hmm. this discussion has inspired them to check it out. So that's always oh, great. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. I actually have just a quick question about names. You know, names are very important. Um, yeah. Can you both talk about uh, how you came, came to your protagonists' names? So for me, the, uh, um, well, actually, it's pretty easy. So my, my firstborn son is named Logan, and I had two daughters. So now Logan lives in my books because I never had a kid or a son. And Pike was, like I said before in the discussion, we, I, call signs are really hard to do they you have to have a call sign that comes out for a bad reason nobody gets a call sign for a good reason nobody is you know called panther because they're <laughs> striking like a cat they're called panther because they pinch themselves or something like that um and everybody already had call signs and so i had to come up with a call sign that nobody had had before uh and the first name nephilim his real first name nephilim was because of genesis and the bible mm -hmm. and his family are a bunch of wackos and so he got the name from that. There was a lot of just kicking around ideas. But the, the hardest thing about names for me are the foreign names. Those are impossible. So yeah. if you're going to do, uh, um, and I've screwed it up more times than I can count. So if you're, you have to have Sunni names, and there's Shia names, and there's Bosniak names, and there's Serbian names, and all this. And so I, in One Rough Man, I was going to have a Bosniak name, so nobody can make sure I did this wrong. And so I did all this research, and found a Bosniak wedding. The Bosniaks are Muslims inside Bosnia. And I found a Bosniak wedding. And so I went down the list of names and found a name and said, that's what I'm gonna use. And it turned out they invited a Serb to the wedding. And so I got, <laughs> so, 
got an email from somebody in Bosnia saying that's a Serbian name. No Bosnian could ever be named that. I'm like, I did the best I could do. I mean, I tried really hard. I'm sorry you invited and served to the wedding. So those are the hardest ones to do is to make sure you get them right. And for American trader, you had to have a bunch of Chinese names, which their names are all inverted. And then you got to figure out how am I going to do it the Chinese way or the American way? So it's hard to do. How about Pike Logan? Where did that name come from? I just explained all that. What's that? I just explained all that. Logan was, uh, I was going to name my firstborn son, Logan. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't have a son. I had two daughters. So I put him in a book. Got, sorry, missed that. <laughs> um, so my, prota my protagonist in my series is Matt Drake. And um, another friend from high school, she um, served as my first reader for everything I've ever written. You know, when I was trying to do short stories, when I was writing novels that sucked, when even to this day, she's still one of my first readers. And her last name, her, her married last name was Drake. And, you know, you got to, maybe it was Lee Child that said something like you want it, even though it must not have been him because Reacher's two syllables that said, your protagonist should have one, one syllable. It's like a dog's name. You want one syllable so you can just pop it out like that. And so I was like, Drake is a great name. And then I had a friend in the, in the FBI I went to the academy with that was a Matt and we called him Matty, Matt, all that kind of stuff. I'm like, that's a great one between the two of them. But from, you know, a larger scale, like, like you said, actually, Patrick, names are so important. I will a lot of times have character XX, character XY or something like that. that. And so, yeah. yeah, because number one, they're so important. Number two, I think all of us hate names and go to the exact same baby website each time right. to try and find the next one and so putting names in oftentimes is one of the last things i do well the worst thing that i've learned early on maybe book four was you create a really unique name and then uh as you type it over and over again it's like all right i'm turning this time to because <laughs> it keeps correcting autocorrecting autocorrecting yes. like right, i'm sick of yes He's gone yes this. <laughs> <laughs> well let's see it looks like that's about it I, I do have a nice comment uh someone says uh a huge fan of both your work and your books helped keep me sane during lockdown so thank you well thank you that's i nice appreciate awesome. that yeah it's a wonderful yeah. thought so guys that brand is. we're gonna see you what january january <laughs> hopefully i'm waiting on edits right now hopefully they're not so bad that i have to start over <laughs> well, let's say with any luck this winter, right? Yes. Which will be wonderful. Um, I miss it because we've had so many wonderful after after event Absolutely. dinners. We need to Absolutely. go back. I miss it too. And Don, you're going to have a Matt Drake book out in what, February or March? In, in, uh, it's going to get bumped back to May. So Hostile Intent, the third Matt Drake book will come out in May. And then I believe the next Jack Ryan Jr. one will be June or July. So maybe maybe we'll squish them together. Yeah. Or not, as the case may be. We'll see how it all plays out. It's too far. Sure. I'm feeling resentful because I had to fill out a, an event grid for a publisher I will not name <laughs> through next April. And I, I wrote, <laughs> I said, it's June. And I can't <laughs> even get June underway. I am not <laughs> able to make any intelligent decisions about who I want to come to the store <laughs> next April. I mean, what are you doing? And you know, it's like throwing darts at a board. It's not like you've had a chance to read the book or even think about it. So you're right. just doing it kind of on name recognition or something. And I think what a meaningless exercise <laughs> it actually is. Sorry. Um, so anyway, that that was in my mind when I, when I said that. So um, thank you guys. It's been a wonderful couple hours for um, to spend together. Really have enjoyed it. Thank and, you for um, We'll see you whenever we see you. Right. Thanks, Absolutely. Patrick. Thanks, guys. Bye, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Done. Don't forget, we have probably by now three um, <laughs> autographed copies of um, Target I have one. It's not autographed. Right. <laughs> this one isn't either here. I just held up. Right. But Patrick has the signed one right there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. There it is. I, love I like it. how right. Don has the subtle product placement. It's like way back there. He does. Yeah. But the nice thing about Don is if we really run out, I can send him more books because he's always sweet about it. Absolutely. You know, always happy to, to be a horrible books. problem. Anyway, uh, and there will be a podcast available for those of you who would like to recommend people listen to this. And this video will stay, <laughs> maybe you'll think, unfortunately, on our website for forever. So uh, do recommend that people who might have missed us this evening um, 
get a chance to watch it. And you don't have to belong to Facebook to go to the Poison Pen video page and tune in. So thank you, everybody. Enjoy the rest of your evening and your week. Good night. night. Thanks, Thanks again, Barbara. guys. Patrick. See you. Seeing you. Good to see you both. See you, Don. See ya. Hello. We hope you're enjoying our programs and podcasts with authors. We'd like to expand them, and your help would be appreciated. Please make a donation at poisonedpenfoundation.org. 100% of the proceeds will go to help connect authors with readers in this difficult time. Thank you.